Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. And this is our holiday mailbag episode. Uh, you're listening to this on December 21st. <clears throat> Sorry, you're listening to this on December 24th. So happy birthday, Dan. I know it's your birthday. It's, 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 I'm so old. I can't stand it. <laughs> Does it really suck having a birthday that is uh, Christmas Eve? You know, I get this question all the time. I'm and sure I would you say do. two things about it. One, up until the day I went to work for Barack Obama in 2007, I had never worked or gone to school on my birthday. And then, thanks to Barack Obama, I worked on my birthday for like five consecutive years. Uh-huh. Um so that's, but generally it's good because you don't, you always have a day off. But two, I don't know whether my parents did a very good job of equaling the presents out or my brother also got screwed, but within the confines of my house, present distribution was fair. So I can't complain. It was fair for you. So your brother did get screwed. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe my parents just did a good job of making sure we, I got the appropriate amount of presents. I don't know whether I got the appropriate amount or he did not get the appropriate amount, but you seem to it feel seemed good fair about at the it. time. That's good. Um, all right, later on the pod, you will hear my interview with Congresswoman-elect Katie Porter from California's 45th District. Uh, we'll talk about uh, her heading to Congress and what her priorities are when she gets there. Um, but first, we have a whole bunch of mailbag questions. Thank you for all your questions. You sent them in on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, a couple other places. I don't know. Some, some of you just shouted them at Elijah. Um, so we'll take some of your questions and, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll go from there. Okay, so first question is from Amy Drouch. Um, how do you get the left to care about the courts as much as the right? It's a good question to think about in light of, you know, the recent uh, Texas ruling trying to rule the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional. Of course, we went through Kavanaugh this year. So, Dan, how do we get our folks to care as much about the courts as the right has for many, many years? Billboards of Brett Kavanaugh's shit-eating grin all across America. <laughs> all right, I do. <laughs> I do like Did that. You want a serious answer to that question <laughs> because that was pretty serious. I think that I think the thing here is I think one. I will be interested to see when we get to the twenty twenty election cycle how much whether Democrats seem to care more than they have in the past. Um, yeah. So that's because I think we have seen through what has happened with Gorsuch and Merrick Garland and Brett Kavanaugh, like in very real terms, what not caring and how not caring enough can have lasting decades long damage on this country. So that's one. Two, I think it's also progressive activists who care about this have not only just voters to convince. I think we also have to convince our elected officials that we care Yeah. because you know, we ha- we're going to have to keep an eye on Senate Democrats for two years to make sure that they are not doing anything to make it easier to put Trump judges on the court. Now, they have limited levers they can pull here because of uh, they don't have the majority. But, you know, I think we got to look with great suspicion at any of these sort of uh, deals that let senators go home early and make it easier for McConnell to confirm Trump's judges. Yeah. And already I was um, happy to see that there were some rumors that Schumer was going to do another one of these deals before the holidays uh, to uh, make sure that a bunch of judges went through in order to get the funding passed and everyone go home. And uh, that did not happen. Uh, At least of this recording, it did not happen. (laughs) But so that's good. And, and, you know, and it's happened before. So maybe our elected officials are starting to get the message. But no, I think you're right. And I think all these candidates in 2020 need to talk about like the court and judges should be part of your stump speech. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one way to get people to care about it is to talk about the issues at stake here. Um, and not just the Supreme court either, but a lot of these lower courts. Uh, and I think that's also going to make a huge difference. Um, not just in the presidential race, uh, in 2020, in case there are additional Supreme court openings, but look, it is going to matter for retaking the Senate in 2020, which is something that I don't want people to just forget about here as we focus on the presidential, because, it is going to be, I think it's almost as important, um, not quite as important, but almost as important to for Democrats to take the Senate in 2020 uh, as to taking the, uh, the presidency. Because if, if we have a Senate the way it is right now, um, I don't think we're getting anything done with the Democratic president and Democratic House. Yeah. Do you think Mitch McConnell is confirming President Kamala Harris or Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden's Supreme Court nominee, even if that, if Ruth Bader Ginsburg resigned at 1201 on January 21st 
the thought will at least cross Mitch McConnell's mind that he should not confirm that person. He should wait four years to confirm that person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that will be the position of the right for sure. And so the Senate is very important. Yes. Um, I would say one other thing about this. Sure. Because this is – of all the questions we'll take, uh, this is maybe the most important. But is – I think at one messaging point is to connect – people's frustration with the money in politics to changing the balance of the court. Because yeah. I think that's what people don't really understand, that the only way you're going to be able to get corporations and billionaires out of politics is to get a different ruling on Citizens United. The only way to get a different ruling on Citizens United is to change the court. Yeah, and again, look, thinking about the Supreme Court, um, the, the next chance we have for a vacancy uh, from a conservative is Clarence Thomas, who is – you know, early 70s right now. So it, we could be waiting a long time. But should that vacancy occur, we're going to need a Democratic president president in there because if there are other vacancies, whether it's Ginsburg, whether it's um, other justices, you know, if, if we get that vacancy from Thomas and there's a Democratic president in there, suddenly we have a 5-4 court again and we have the majority in the court. So that's how fast it can change. And so that's why it's so important to, so important to both have a Democratic Senate in place at the time and have a, a Democratic president. Um, okay, Sarah F.G. Smith asks, why isn't anyone talking about the six-week abortion ban that Ohio is on the verge of adopting? It is a horrifying violation of women's constitutional right to access an abortion, since most don't even know they're pregnant until uh, eight weeks. Um, can we discuss, please? Yes, we can. Uh, and I think this sort of goes to the first question about the courts. Um, and just so people know, this ban, this would be a ban on all abortions after um, six weeks. And there would be exceptions for the life and health of the mother, but no other exceptions. No exceptions for rape, no exceptions for incest. And it has passed the Ohio House. It has passed the Ohio Senate. Uh, John Kasich, who is still the governor now, has said he would veto it. But the incoming Republican governor of Ohio... Mike DeWine has said that he would sign the bill. So uh, that's that's where we are right now. Dan, what do you think about this? I think I think this this is such an important question, such an important issue, because when going back to the Supreme Court again, when the Supreme Court refused to take out these cases um, about Planned Parenthood a few weeks ago, some people breathed a sigh of relief and said, well, maybe these they were telling the truth and they don't really want to take on abortion. But if you believe uh, sort of what legal, what the right wing legal scholars and activists say is they are waiting for this case. Mm -hmm. This is the case that will come before the Supreme Court that could be the, the opportunity for them to re overturn Roe v. Wade. And this we need to scream from the rooftops about this. And I feel negligent that we haven't done it yet. But as we come as we round the bend from the new year and. Mike DeWine takes over. We have to do everything we can to put to raise awareness of this, and because it's not this is not just about Ohio. This has become a mo this is not some you know far right Southern state. This is a purple state that has taken this path, and it's become become a model for Republicans across the country. So this is, has to be a centerpiece of activism heading into 2019 and into 2020. Yeah, and I will say, and I, I did some research on this, and. It looks like there's a lot of legal scholars as well as um, women's reproductive groups who believe that there is a small chance that the Supreme Court takes this particular case up. Um, they think that it is such a direct hit to Roe and so contradicts the ruling in Roe v. Wade that, um, you know, that lower courts will likely find it unconstitutional and then maybe the Supreme Court won't take it. Not because the Supreme Court has, you know, the, the Kavanaugh, Roberts, majority on the court has suddenly had a change of heart on this, but because there are other cases that are even closer to the Supreme Court already that have to do with restricting a woman's right to choose that might be easier for them to take and then rule and as a way to chip away at um, women's right to choose and access to abortion, that they might take those instead. But of course, you know, we can't be sure of anything anymore. And this is all in the courts. And um, like you said, this is just something that we have to be aware of and 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 fight you know, sorry, and uh, and fight like hell over uh, because this is these are the very real threats now that Brett Kavanaugh is on the court. And it's a reminder to the states who have Democratic governors, Democratic legislatures, many of whom newly elected uh, in office starting next year, that they need if they do not already have a book, a law on the books, which preserves the right to reproductive freedom in that 
state, they need to pass that law so that yeah. uh, it, you could pretend you have the potential, depending on a Supreme Court ruling, to protect the right to choose within your state if the Supreme Court essentially makes it a state's rights issue. And so getting it on the book is incredibly important. So it should be a priority for, along with a lot of other things, but it should be at the top of the list for these new Democratic governors. Uh, another question from, name I can't pronounce, T. Cusel? I don't know. Um, will there be a Jeff Flake of 2019-2020? I don't know this if that... is the most obvious answer <laughs> in the entire world. Uh, I think I know. Do you want? Can I take a shot at it? Absolutely. Yes, it is. Uh, his name is Willard Mitt Romney. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. You are correct, ding, sir. Ding ding ding! ding. I've, I've been calling him <laughs> New Jeff Flake. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I don't want to prejudge. Maybe, maybe Mitt Romney is suddenly going to have a change of heart, and everything we saw from him in the presidential campaign, and you know, maybe he'll he'll turn out to be a real hero. But I'm nope. But I'm not, not gonna, gonna happen. I would not. I'm like, not gonna place any money on that. But this this is even prediction. This is like me predicting the sun is coming up tomorrow. <laughs> it is 100 percent guaranteed to happen. Mitt Romney is someone who, to his great credit, went all in on being against a Trump. Unlike some of the most of the spineless weasels of the Republican Party, all in gave the centerpiece never Trump speech in the campaign mm. when Trump uh, won. I think he even continued in a lot of ways to be strong, putting out statements when it was appropriate, speaking out more aggressively on things like when the president, I don't know, sided with Nazis and things like that. Then he started running for Senate in Utah, and then I saw one bad poll and then tried to tell reporters he was never actually never Trump. So I didn't take that to be an encouraging sign that he would be a vessel for the courageous never Trump movement all across this country. <laughs> I actually thought when I first read that question, they were wondering if... Um, there's going to be like if, if Jeff Flake or someone like that's going to challenge Trump in the primary, which I'd be interested for your thoughts on, too. I think that just reading the tea leaves of uh, the Twitter accounts of John Kasich and John Weaver, who is John Kasich, longtime political strategist mm -hmm. and uh, sort of help was the engineer McCain's challenge to George W. Bush in 2000. Uh, I get the sense that John Kasich is very much thinking about running against. Uh, I'm sorry, let me try again. Is John John Kasich is very much thinking about running against Trump in 2020? The problem is there is basically zero room to the right of Trump, and no room. Let me, that's confusing. Basically, running against Trump in the Republican primaries to Trump's left seems like an impossible task. Yeah, but it is notable that. The Republicans are not super confident because they have proposed canceling the South Carolina primary um, as a way to protect Trump so in crazy. this upcoming election, which is something that apparently has happened many times in the past. So this is not totally unique, but it is at least a sign that they have some fears of a primary challenge. Yeah, no, uh, my view on this is if for some reason there was someone to challenge from, if, sorry, if for some reason uh, a candidate came along and decided to challenge Trump from the right, said that Trump has you know, ignored his MAGA base and, you know, didn't build the wall. And, oh, look, he signed into law this bipartisan criminal justice reform and he's a cuck now. <laughs> like, like, I guess that would just be like, you know, a uh, fucking human version of InfoWars or something. Um, right, yeah. Challenged by Alex Jones. <laughs> right, yeah, that's the only, to me, that's the only potential threat to Trump because most of the Republican Party, what's left of it, the constituency of the Republican Party, I'd say at least... I don't know, 70, 80 percent of it. They're they're Trump fans. They're 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 yeah. behind them all the way. And so, yeah, there's a small constituency for John Kasich. I'm sure out there Republicans who are disappointed with Trump, Republicans who may have voted Democrat in this uh, 2018 election. I'm sure they're out there, but I don't think they represent anywhere near a majority of the party. Yeah, or even a, they're not even a distinct minority. Yeah, <laughs> it's, just, it's like a handful of people. I'm sad to say. Um, Taylor Nelson Haney asks. How to engage voters in districts suffering from voter suppression? Living in Georgia, the morale feels low, even though Democrats won overall. What's the message for Democrats in these tough places? This is a really hard one. Um, and I hearken back to um, Latasha Brown of Black Voters Matter, who is an activist who works 
in, in, across the South, um, particularly in African American communities, who was our guest on the final of the four HBO specials, who mm. really talked uh, both in our interview and then in a New York Times op-ed piece she wrote uh, this fall very powerfully about how you engage these communities. And it's really about talking to them about their power, the power they have despite these laws and the, uh, they try to take that power away. And talking to them about um, – it's like an education process, right, about what their power is and then how you can put yourself in a position where you can overcome the laws being put in place by – people like Brian Kemp in Georgia. And I think like following the Latasha's model is very interesting and compelling. And I think we could all learn a lot from the work that she did in Alabama during the Doug Jones race and all across the South uh, in 2018. Yeah. I mean, voter suppression is real. It's insidious. It's probably the worst it's been since the Jim Crow era. Like we know that, but at the same time we should remember Stacey Abrams received more votes than any Democrat in Georgia's history. Um, and I, th- I, I, th- I think the only way to stop voter suppression is to keep fighting it, keep organizing. Um, it remains true that there are still more voters who don't turn out because they don't think it's important than voters who don't turn out because Republic- Republicans have made it hard for them, um, which I think is sometimes lost in the conversation around voter suppression, which, again, is very real and a real threat. And I think that the only way that we're going, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because it's a, you know, it's a catch 22 here. Like the only way we're going to change the laws is to win <laughs> and winning is made that much tougher because voter suppression's in place, but it's not impossible. Um, there's ways to organize and there's, you know, there's, there's work on the ground to be done. So I would tell those people, you know, don't lose heart. And I know it's disappointing and you have every right to be angry of, about the result in Georgia. I sure am. Um, but you got to keep fighting. Uh, be, and, and there are there are plenty of voters out there who are willing to vote, who are willing to jump through the hoops and jump o- and, and you know overcome the obstacles they put in uh, your way to go out there and vote. Yeah, it's really about organizing, organizing now and not. And this is two other points Latasha made in our conversation. I thought really important. One is the work has to continue long after the election, right? It's, yeah. It can't be this traditional two-year cycle where you show up, uh, you know, three months before the election and, you know, do some organizing and then pack up the first Wednesday in November. Yep. It's This has to be sustained organizing that goes on for years. Mm-hmm. And that's how you do it. And the other thing she said, too, that I thought was fascinating, which is slightly apart from the question about voter suppression, but it goes right at your point that there are more voters who just choose not to turn out. And Latasha said uh, to me during that HBO show that most non-voters are not apathetic. Yeah. They're actually quite passionate about their decision not to vote. And I think that's a very important thing for Democratic politicians to, um, to, Democratic politicians to learn, which is people are making a choice not to vote. They are choosing not to do it. Be- in many cases, because they don't feel like that vote matters, that mm-hmm. you have not, you as a politician have not made a case about why it matters. And that we have to move some of the agents, instead of just yelling at voters to stop being lazy, we have to put some of the burden on politicians to make it, make that vote matter. Not just make a compelling case in the run up to election day, but once you get into office, your job is is to make it so that the person who waited in line three hours, who took time off work or carried their kids and stood in the rain while they could vote, that they feel like that was worth it. Because if you just go there and once you have that, you pocket that vote and go on and sort of do what you would normally do in Washington, then you have failed that person. Yeah. And again, those of us who pay close attention to politics, uh, people who are listening to this podcast, um, we get why it's important to vote. We get, you know, Trump is president. Of course you got to vote. Like this is, you know, the most important election of our lifetime. Like we, we get all that. But you have to understand that there are people out there who do not pay close attention to politics. And they feel like no one is listening to them. And they feel like the system is broken. And they feel like the game is rigged. And yes, everyone has a responsibility to educate themselves about the news and politics, of course. But if we want to build a winning coalition... We want to build a majority in this country to pass progressive policies. It's also incumbent upon all of us who want that to go out and talk to the people who don't necessarily think that politics is for them or that politics actually responds to their lives. That's on us. So I I do think you're right that um, 
we have to uh, we have to continue to have those conversations with people who don't vote and find out what they are passionate about and 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 tell them you know here's how to here's how to fix that problem that you're having. Um, okay, um, it may it me oh it me <laughs> asks <laughs> it's, all, it's all in one word here. Um, where should our priorities be as a party right now? Focus on 2020, stop the border wall, green new deal, income inequality, healthcare, something else. What do you think, Dan? Yes. <laughs> All of the above. Yeah. I mean, I think our primary responsibility has to be put a check on Trump, put a check on the corruption, put a check on the criminality, put a check on the incompetence. There is mountains of undue work digging into what this government's been doing for the last few years. And that has to be our first priority, more so than cutting some fucking infrastructure deal with Trump or passing some message bill. We should pass all the bills we can. I really like the idea the Democrats have had about um, electoral reform and voting reform as as one of the first bills they're going to do. That's great. I think having a committee to dig into the Green New Deal is great. We should do all those things. But your job for the next two years is to stop Trump. That is why people elected you. That's what we want you to do. Anything that compromises that, I think, needs to be looked at very hard before we go down the road. I agree with that. I think that, like, on a parallel track, we also need to start offering our alternative vision for the country based on what people care about, right? Their jobs, their wages, the cost of living, what kind of country we want to live in. And I think, you know, the presidential candidates are probably going to handle that. And, uh, you know, as you pointed out, the Democrats in the House, as they pass some of these, as people call them, messaging bills, um, and they say that because obviously they're not going to pass the Senate, but at least it lets the American people know what the Democrats' priorities are and what the priorities would be if Democrats had full control over Washington. So I do think that's important to start laying out what our vision is, what a world, what a post-Trump world might look like if uh, if Democrats had control. Uh, because I think, you know, obviously this, I think first and foremost, this election is going to be a referendum on Trump. Um, but... There's going to be a lot of people wondering, OK, well, I know I don't like Trump and I don't want him in there. But what you know, what are Democrats going to do? What would the country look like under Democrat control, Democratic control? And um, so I think that's it's useful to at least start telling that story. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Um, Walk and chew gum, people. Yeah, you can do both. Uh, Thea Dirty asks, do you believe that Democrats run the risk of going into the 2020 election too complacent? For example, do you think there's a possibility that they may think there is no way Trump could win, and so they end up making a mistake similar to 2016? I mean, that's going to obviously keep me up at night every night from now until 2020. <laughs> but uh, I don't think that will happen, but who knows? I don't know. What do you think? I, I think, yeah, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about everything. Everything. That is the lesson of 2016. Worry about everything. Panic about nothing. <laughs> I, I think we, too, we have to be very honest with ourselves. And sometimes when we like, you know, we we talk to groups or we see people, people are shocked by this point that I often make, which is right now Trump is the favorite to be reelected. If you were just going to put money on what is the most sure case, it would be that Trump would get reelected. And I say that before everyone fucking drives their car off a road or throws <laughs> their phone in the sewer because incumbent presidents usually get reelected. There are two factors that have stopped incumbents from getting reelected in the last couple of decades. And both of these factors have had to be in place for it to happen because there's only been two presidents who were not reelected in recent history, Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush. Both of these two factors were a primary challenge from their ideological flank, Ted Kennedy in 80 and uh, Pat Buchanan in 88, and then it, and a third party candidate. John Anderson in 80, Ross Perot in 88. Neither of those, one of those factors is almost certainly not happening, and the other one may or may not happen. So given that, you would say Trump has a very good chance to be reelected. But there are a couple, there are some mitigating factors. He's incredibly unpopular. He's incredibly stupid. He is under every aspect of his life from grade school till, till he got to the White House, is under criminal investigation. And there are more Democratic voters and Republican voters in this country. And so it is we should not be we should not. Certainly anyone who is complacent has been fucking napping for two years and should not be around. But this is going to be a very tough race to win. And we're going to have to be very smart and have a very good candidate who has a very good campaign 
to and take advantage of every opportunity to win. Yeah, and you know, the Trump voters, they showed up in 2016, they showed up again in 2018. Um, we won in 2018 because we had astronomical turnout um, among Democratic voters, and we pulled over some Republicans as well. But a lot of those Trump voters that voted in 2016, they didn't stay home in 2018, and there's a good chance they're not staying home in 2020. So um, we, we are going to have to do everything right. Uh, this brings me to the next question from L. Vanderbill. As we gear up for 2020, how can we avoid the Democratic infighting that dragged on beyond the primaries like we saw in 2016? Great question. I wish, I hope, does anyone have an answer? Tweet at us, because I don't have a fucking clue. <laughs> this, this is the thing that keeps me up the most right now. Um, because, you know, we're already seeing this. And it's like, I, I don't know how we can avoid it. I know how every person out there can contribute to avoiding it, which is, you know, talk about why you like your chosen candidate, right? Uh, if you prefer one candidate. Talk about the positive uh, parts of that candidate's policy agenda or their record or whatever you may like about them. Like, don't go around talking, especially this early, about why you can't stand the other candidates. I've already seen on Twitter some people, hashtag never Bernie, hashtag never Beto, hashtag never Biden, hashtag never count. Like, never nothing. Stop. Don't do that. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> don't, and the other thing, don't get in dumb Twitter fights with the people who love getting into dumb Twitter fights on both sides. I don't pay attention to them anymore. I, maybe I'll see it when I scroll by. I'm not responding anymore. I'm not dealing with it. Because you know what happens? Those fights start on Twitter now, and then journalists who spend their time on Twitter as well, they start writing about those fights. So they're not reflective of what's actually happening out in the country. Because if you start looking at some of these polls, these early polls right now, the approval rating for almost all of these candidates is quite good. Most Democrats like all of these candidates in the real world. They like all of these candidates. In Twitter world, it's a fucking mess. <laughs> but in the real world, most people in this party would be very happy and have warm feelings to just about all of these candidates that have been mentioned uh, to be running. So, you know, I would just tell everyone, keep an open mind yourself about all the candidates. Tell your friends to keep in mind, uh, open mind about all the candidates. And when you're talking about them, talk about what you like about certain candidates and don't start attacking all the rest of the field. Ugh. When you said a few minutes ago that you had made a decision to not pay attention to the primary related Twitter battles <laughs> on the internet, were you you made that? When did you make that pledge? I Five meant, minutes ago. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, Our, I, your text messages from today suggest that. Uh, allow you me not to rephrase. That. I'm not. I'm not engaging in them. Is what I'm going to do. Okay. Uh, I'm going. Okay. I, I can't right, ignore them unless I get off to. I mean. There'll be another resolution that you'll hear in our resolutions episode on Thursday about um, one of my big resolutions, which is how to use Twitter better. <laughs> so that's a that's a resolution that's starting now. But um, yeah, it's just it's bad already. It's bad. Well, I th I'd say just two points about this. We should not be so pessimistic just yet because yeah. one, Twitter is not real life. That's right. It just isn't. It That's is my a, new mantra for the new year, by the way. Twitter's not real. Yeah, it is a fun house mirror version of politics in a particularly unfun fun house that sadly becomes reflected in uh, across broader press coverage because it's reporters basically like the new man on the street interview is to just read tweets and have that affect your worldview, right. uh, which is pretty fucking stupid and uh, really damning for the current state of journalism. And two... This is a, going to be, at least for a long time, it appears, a many, many, many candidate field. The problem we had in 16 and for part, for some of 08 was it was two candidates. And so it's either you're for – if you're for Bernie, you're against Hillary. Yeah. If you're for Hillary, you're against Bernie. Or you could you know, in, to, you know, find and replace Bernie with Brock if you want to do 08. You know, you saw this and you worked in the 2004 presidential campaign when there are many candidates – you can be for John Kerry and you're not necessarily against, vehemently against John Edwards or against Dick Gephardt or, you yeah. know what I mean? Like there's like it, it, your hatred can be diluted a, around a number of people. And hopefully that happens too. The other thing is hopefully people recognize, like if there was a question about whether it mattered, whether Hillary or Trump was the winner, well, I think we know the fucking answer to that question and it matters a hell of a lot.
Yeah. And look, a- again, e- like even the 2016 divisions were are overblown. Um, you know, most the vast vast majority, something like 70 80%, per- 80% I think, of uh Bernie supporters ended up voting for Hillary. Um, most Hillary voters have a um, you know, Bernie has a good approval rating among most Hillary voters as well. So like again, it's overblown in the end. I do think in in 2004 the dynamic was um, it was Howard Dean versus the rest of the field because Dean was the insurgent. And so there was this like anger between Dean supporters and everyone else. But again, this was back in 2004 and there wasn't Twitter or uh, other social media to sort of amplify the divisions as we have now. Um, but I do, you, you are right that in a, in a big field, it becomes less likely that you get the sort of battle royale between two candidates. Yeah. Twitter has basically become a world where all reporters are forced to do made on the street interviews, but they have to go to the dumbest, angriest street in all of America to do them. <laughs> that, is, that is very apt. Um, all right, some fun questions. Ang Tricario, what are your favorite holiday traditions? What do you got, Dan? Um, I don't play games. Do you, do you also play games after Christmas dinner? Or we do play like... games. Yeah, we do play some games as well. Okay, you seem to have a very you and Emily seem to have very fun families. <laughs> this will be this is gonna be like cheesy new dad tradition thing. But when I was a kid, uh, like young kid, we would all wait. My family would always get together and we would read the night before Christmas on Christmas Eve, which was the day you're reading, listening to this podcast and also my birthday. And that was sort of our like last thing we did before we went to bed and waited for Santa. So now, like obviously we haven't done that for many, many years in my family, but now that my daughter is here, we're going to do, we're going to go visit my parents and we're going to do, we're going to restart that tradition uh, this year. That's great. We used to do that too. There's somewhere, somewhere there is an audio tape of me as a two year old reciting Twas the Night Before Christmas with my mom helping me a lot <laughs> that I've heard before. But yeah, we used to do it all the time. We um, uh, we just did Christmas with my parents since we're going to Cincinnati um, this week. Uh, and we always do like, I'll play Christmas carols on the piano and my mom will sing and everyone else will have a little sing along. And then now with Emily's family, we have a tradition that they've had for a long time, which is um, they play an audio version of the Christmas Carol, Dickens, the Christmas Carol, and everyone sits around and has like hot chocolate or whatever. And no one, everyone has to put their phones away. No one can speak. It's just all silence listening to the Christmas Carol um, through the whole thing, which is, I've done it for a few years now. It's really nice not to look at your phone or talk. I love that. It's very great. Yeah. The, the, uh, the black family is a, uh, they're a good time. Um, Okay. Don't boo vote asks, what types of media do you consume when not obsessively refreshing Twitter, reading the news? Uh, uh, is there a specific book, movie, episode of television that was favorite in 2018? Hmm. I have so first? many. I have like a whole list of them. Go. So television. Uh, the Good Place. One of my favorite shows. My favorite show on network television. Uh, Homecoming. Great British Bake Off. Uh, Wild Wild Country. Bojack Horseman. Succession. Nanette, I'm trying to think of any others. That's that's my initial list. Movies, favorite movies of the year. Black Panther, amazing. Blockers, my favorite comedy. <laughs> Won't You Be My Neighbor, my favorite documentary about Mr. Rogers. Um, took me back. And then, uh, as you know, I don't really read. But um, I read uh, The Last Campaign by Thurston Clark about Bobby Kennedy's campaign in 68 is fantastic. Michelle Obama's book, Becoming... Excellent. Just read that. And the novel Less, um, I think it won the Pulitzer Prize last year, is uh, very well worth a read. Those are my those are my recommendations. OK, my TV would be um, not counting the Pod Safe America HBO special, but would be <laughs> I'm not going to redo the below deck thing, but I really do enjoy below deck uh, succession, Atlanta um, and uh Top Chef are three shows that I greatly enjoy. My family, my wife and I have also very got, gotten very into Outlander, which oh, I, I haven't read is since like it's a very unique uh, like niche of the internet show, but I thoroughly enjoy. Um, 
books, uh, the best non-Obama related books I read this year. Yes, Ben Rhodes. Yes, Alyssa Master Monaco. Yes. Uh, yes, we can. Michelle yeah, Obama. I forgot. Yes, we can on my list. I read. I read yeah, that book. Yeah. Yes, we still can. <laughs> I was, Sorry. <laughs> I was gonna. I was. Gonna, <laughs> I was. I wasn't offended. Um, it's in parentheses. It, I so, because I almost book. exclusively read books either written by my friends or fiction, uh, because why? After, if you're gonna basically for a living consume politics all day long it's nice to do something totally different so the three best books i read this year maybe like best is not the right word my three most favorite books i've read this year were the mars room by rachel kushner mm -hmm. they're there by tommy orange and the immortalist by chloe benjamin mm -hmm. coincidentally all three of them take place uh in the bay area in the past but they were just all three phenomenal books and then one other book is uh the feral detective by jonathan letham who is probably my favorite author of the last decade or so. Um, hey, he had a new book that just came out. Great. I'm going to take since, your recommendations. Si since we had a baby, uh, I've seen almost no movies. Uh, the la I can't remember the last time I went to the movie theater. Um, but obviously Black Panther, which I saw on an airplane, but was great. And then like the movie that I weirdly enjoyed the most, because I had super low expectations, but uh, it just blew me away, was The Quiet Place. Uh, uh, with John Krasinski and Emily Blunt, uh, it was just it was, and I don't even really watch horror movies, but it was phenomenal. And it's also a good metaphor for our life once we put our daughter down for a nap, because the premise of the movie is if you make noise, monsters come. I, and so it's like you we were very quiet in our house. And so I think about that movie a lot. There's no chance I was um, ever watching that movie. It was but the other the other it's like <laughs> I'll give I you uh, two albums that I really enjoyed this year. Oh. Uh which were I listen almost exclusively to hip hop, so take that for what it will. Um, no name, uh, who is, is this rapper? This female rapper from from Chicago that is amazing, and Smino uh, has an album called Noir that just came out. That is, I just randomly stumbled onto it on Spotify, and it's phenomenal. All right, oh, that's good. All right, um, Emily Primo asks, "How did John, John, Tommy, and Dan all meet? Do they remember their first interactions?" All right, let's see. Um, I met Tommy first in 2004. I was on the Kerry campaign. It was the beginning of the general election. Um, Tommy had been on the Edwards campaign in the primary. They just lost. And Tommy's cousin, Wendy Button, was a speechwriter with me on Kerry. And Tommy was looking for a job. And so he stopped by our office and he was interviewing at the Kerry campaign for a job, which he smartly decided not to take. So he could then go work on um, uh, the campaign of state senator Barack Obama. And that worked out pretty well for him. And then I met Tommy again in the Senate office uh, during our first week on the job. I met you, I believe this was in 2006 when I was in the Obama Senate office and you came in right after or while you were about to take the job for the campaign. Is that right? That's basically right. Yeah. And then we went out and then you and me and Tommy and Bill Burton, who had just taken the job as press secretary, all went out for dinner that night at Fogo de Chao. Right. You, I was just going to say we went to Fogo de Chao. That was, <laughs> we were so classy. Yeah, we were very classy. That was 2006. And then Love It I met because he applied for a job in, um, in the Obama administration and he had been a Hillary Clinton speechwriter and it was between him and someone else. And I interviewed him at a Starbucks near the transition office in DC. And he was hilarious as he always is. And, um, and I said, Oh, this guy's funny. I mean, I think he, he writes pretty well, but he's really funny. So he should definitely be on the team since we need some humor. And, uh, and that was love it. What about you? Did I, how did you meet? So, uh, oh, I guess Tommy and love it. So Tommy, I first met, uh, when he fir moved to D.C. after uh, working on the Obama Senate elections, this was 2005, and I had a, and a, we had a, a friend of mine who had been a uh, who's from Chicago who had been a supporter of Obama's sort of had a dinner to welcome Tommy to D.C. and he described Tommy as this young uh, this young hotshot who had worked for a friend of mine on the Edwards campaign when Tommy worked for Edwards in 2004 before Obama. So Tommy and I went to dinner together when he first moved to DC. I don't even think he had an apartment yet. Um, I was trying to remember the first time I met Lovett and it was either in the transition office after you hired him. I can't remember what order these things happened in, but I, I think I met him briefly in the transition office and then 
uh, during the transition, I was shopping at the mall because I had to buy like suits and things because we had real jobs now. <laughs> and I ran into Lovett in the department store who reintroduced himself to me at like Bloomingdale's or something. I can't believe he introduced himself to you and didn't just sort of like walk away because it's like that's that's a very forward social interaction from Lovett. <laughs> yeah, it was it was incredibly awkward, and then we did, probably didn't speak again for six months. I thought you guys first met on the uh, first episode of Pod Save America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was going to be my joke, but people read way too much into that. I was going to say, I was say we, we still haven't met yet. <laughs> um, okay, so that's us. That's first. That's first meetings. All right, Melissa Thompson from Instagram. This is a great question. You are kidnapped by a mischievous but well-meaning elf who transports you to an enchanted room where visitors are compelled to speak only the truth. The elf says you can have one hour in the truth-telling room with anyone other than Donald Trump. Who do you pick and why? I have my answer. Okay, I have a question. Sure. Is, like, what are the Miranda rights about what happens in this room? The Miranda rights? Oh. Like, I mean, can it be used against you in a court of law? Do you have immunity? Against – oh, like if someone tells you something? Yeah. Like, so here's my point. Like, if if I can use my, this magic elf room to get Donald Trump Jr. in jail, I'm certainly doing oh, that. Oh, wow. That, that is happening. That is some devious shit, Dan. Good good thinking. Yeah. I like where your head is. Yes, you can. Absolutely. Yeah. This is our, okay, so this that is would our be, magical if, elf if room. It, yeah. So if I could do that, I would use Donald Trump Jr. probably. Um if you really wanted to get the bottom of the Russia thing, maybe Putin would be your first choice. I You'd mean, find out about the P tape, all these other things. Mueller, man, Robert Mueller is my choice. I would sit there with Mueller, and I had so many questions. I would just find it all out, and then I would be able to. I'd probably be more productive with my life because then I would know what was going on, and I wouldn't be reading all these stories and trying to follow all these leads and connecting all this red string on the board like that. I just get get Bobby three sticks in there. And uh, and I'll just I'll just start firing away. That's that's my uh, that's my choice. If it could be someone who was dead, I would pick Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby. Like if you could find out about the Kennedy assassination, that seems like an interesting use of that room. Or the other thing I'm very curious about, which is like a deeply esoteric window into my crazy sports brain, is. Back when Michael Jordan mysteriously retired from basketball in the 90s for a year and a half, there were many rumors that it was part of a gambling investigation from the NBA. And so I would have NBA Commissioner David Stern in that room because I want to know the truth about what made Michael Jordan retire mysteriously for 18 months. If you asked, all my various choices. If you asked a million people this question, I don't know if any would pick David Stern. <laughs> I, th- I bet you, uh, I bet you, our former boss Bill Simmons. You think Bill would Simmons would have David Stern on his list because he is. My obsession with this is partially fueled by him bringing it up on his podcast about once every six months. I would love to hear Bill's answers to this because I bet he'd have some good ones, especially in the world of sports. Um, okay, final question from Heather Live. Dan's thoughts on Paul Ryan's legacy. Now, before you answer, uh, here at Cricket Media, we have a little something for you to listen to, Dan. Uh, that we'd like you to just... Oh, oh yeah, exciting. This is, this is for you. I don't like Paul Ryan. <laughs> Paul Ryan is the phoniest fucking person <laughs> in America. <laughs> Paul Ryan is as responsible for Donald Trump being president as any person walking the planet today, with the possible exceptions of Vladimir Putin and Jim Comey. Trump could murder someone, and Paul Ryan would be fine with it dan definitely wins the paul ryan oh god he hates award. paul ryan yeah. he hates him he was born in a college republicans test tube hatched by carl rove i know he'd like to think the first line of his wikipedia page will be the tax cut but it won't be it will be the shame that comes from his conduct with trump in office and that is just a fact and it is unchangeable at this point no matter how many times he puts out lukewarm statements so he can sleep at least five minutes a night we have a statement from Noted Ryan hater Dan Pfeiffer. Dan sent in the statement he couldn't be here today. Paul Ryan may leave Congress, but the stain of his cowardice and complicity will remain. Paul Ryan will do nothing to save us. Yeah, I think we've all realized. I don't, but kinda... I don't like Paul Ryan. No, I... <laughs> <He's>... <laughs> if that wasn't clear. <laughs> I have to say, I'm mildly embarrassed by that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> are you? We were so proud. Elijah and Michael put that together, and they are very proud of it. And we have been laughing, as they laughing. should be. It's really great. But it's like I like there is a certain. I find myself. To, I generally fi- believe myself to at least be a pretty even keeled person. Yeah, no, you are. And there is something about Paul Ryan that sends me into a fit of rage. And like, I don't even remember the things I say, like they're not planned. I don't write them down in advance. (laughs) I have no, there are no rant notes. They just come. It is an organic anger. And I think there's also like a hormone that makes me forget the things I said immediately afterwards. So this is just me being reminded of them, which I'm, I've been, I am both proud and slightly embarrassed, I guess would be the way my reaction to that. Well, I'm, I'm proud of you for hearing them. I mean, I think it was a fantastic send-off. You know, look, we figured Paul Ryan has a six-part video series uh, sending himself off by his own legacy that he's been – but he gave a speech and everything. The least we could do is put together a little Dan Pfeiffer on Paul Ryan compilation, which, um, you know, I think, uh, I think people will enjoy it very much. Do you have any can other I thoughts you'd like to add? Two final words about Paul Ryan? Yes, please do. Please do. So I have spent some time in anticipation of this moment trying to understand what it is about Paul Ryan that makes me so mad. Because I, like, trust me, Marco Rubio, I find upsetting. Mitch McConnell, one of the worst things that has ever happened to American politics, also makes me mad. Jeff Flake's impotence makes me mad. Uh, Donald Trump, I obviously do not like. <laughs> Donald Trump Jr., terrible. There are people, like lots of people bother me, but Paul Ryan in particular bothers me. Because It's not because of who Paul Ryan is, because he's basically, he's not a, he's no one. He is like a, he is a, ve- a empty vessel for people to pour their hopes and dreams into. Mm. And the thing that I think makes me, that like focuses my anger on Ryan is that he represents both the worst in, Republican politicians, the worst in what everyone hates about politicians generally, and the sort the glorification of Paul Ryan represents the worst of American journalism and punditry. Mm. All of those things together in one human being who made a choice, a actual cho- he actually chose this path that he was in. Like if you listen to his. I didn't. I did not watch his speech today, but I want to thank the ten thousand people on Twitter who uh, sent it to me. Um, <laughs> the, and, but like everything in these final interviews has been like, and even from all of the Ryan apologists in conservative media or right wing think tanks, is boy, you know what a tough deal for this wonky Jack Kempian Republican to be forced to be speaker while Donald Trump is president, and it's like. He didn't have to just fold and supplicate himself to Donald Trump. That was a choice he made. It was a political choice, a choice born of political expediency and cowardice that has proven to be the disastrous politically, disastrous morally, and and the his one um, point of pride based on the six part taxpayer funded video his office sent out about passing this tax bill has also proven to be a policy disaster. The economy has gotten worse yeah. since that bill passed, significantly worse. The stock market is way down. You have to be a special kind of stupid to pass a tor- corporate tax cut and have the stock market tank. <laughs> so that's my take. I mean, the, the good news for you and for all of us, really, is at least from what I've seen, and I'm sure you follow this even more closely than I do, um, I have not seen many glowing pieces about Paul Ryan or his legacy as he leaves. Like, I feel like the journalism punditry aspect of what has always concerned you about Paul Ryan, which has been true for a very, very long time, has finally come to terms with who Paul Ryan really is and who he isn't. Um, and I, I thought like emblematic of this was that Washington Post piece from yesterday that started quoting Paul Ryan's close friends on background (laughs) saying like Paul doesn't really understand how bad everything is and how bad he fucked this up um and I thought to me I was like you know what when you've got a close friend on background saying that I don't need to put any more spin on the ball I'm just gonna leave it as it is take it easy buddy have a nice retirement enjoy your lobbying here's an important point Paul Ryan's not going away. Like yeah. we're going to, those of us 
on the Paul Ryan beat are going to have to stay vigilant because <laughs> six months from now, he's going to go to the Heritage Foundation. He's going to be welcomed with open arms by even some of our never Trumper yeah. allies in the battle against Trump. There, he is going to give a speech about pushing back against the alt right and returning the party to the roots of Reagan. The press will cheer. Centrist pundits will swoon. And then six months, 18, 12 months, 18 months, I don't know, Paul Ryan will run for Senate from Wisconsin. Oh, boy. I was think, I was actually thinking He's not, maybe he runs for governor of Wisconsin. He could do that. I think – I mean, he wants to be as close to Tortilla Coast as possible at all times. So true, true, he has to return to Washington. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But he's not done. He is taking a break to try to cleanse the stench of Trumpian failure off of his body, and he's going to return to politics. He – 100%. Like, the idea that he's just going to drift off and never be heard from again is impossible for me to imagine. So, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll probably direct some rage at Rubio or I don't know. I'm going to have a lot to say about Mitt Romney, I think. I think he's going to be a great disappointment to me. Um, but, Paul Ryan, we're going to keep an eye on you at all times. On that note, um, we will now go to our interview with someone in Congress who makes us inspired and happy and hopeful. Uh, Congresswoman-elect... Katie Porter from the 45th District of California. My interview with her right after this.